Well, Dr. Ransby, it's so great to be with you. I am thinking about the first time we met in person in 3D, as folks are saying Mm -hmm. these days with COVID. Mm -hmm. And you see, you organized 100 Black women for Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. We did. We did. In defense of her. In defense of her. President Trump was going after her really hard and his some of his supporters joined in on that and she could not catch a break every where she turned she was being attacked and so you organized that and of course we attracted people from other ethnicities uh, mm-hmm. to lift and support our work but you led that what 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 motivated you to do that and why did you reach out to black women from a variety from the spectrum. I mean, you didn't just, you reached out from black, to black women of from all walks of life. Right. Well, you know, I, 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 I'm reluctant to take credit all by myself. I mean, I think there was a, there was a collective of us. I think we were watching um, Ilhan take so many blows and get so much both racist and sexist harassment attacks, treatment from this, you know, who is supposed to be the most powerful person in the country, the president of the United States uh, and his uh, supporters. And we just really felt we had to say something. So uh, the Movement for Black Lives, which I work with very closely, Tenjiwe McHarris, you know, my old friend, Angela Davis, uh, Alicia Garza, uh, a number of us, you know, I, I were in communication and really decided uh, that we wanted to, to have a, visual, a visible show of support for Ilhan from black women. You know, a long time ago, in 1991, I was one of the people who uh, co-founded something called African American Women in Defense of Ourselves. And that was around uh, the Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas controversy when Anita Hill was being attacked. And we really took the position that we don't, we're not asking anybody to defend us. We can defend ourselves, but we need to come together in order to do that. And we need to acknowledge when we see a sister under attack. And so it was that vibe, it was that politic, it was that, you know, gut reaction to the attacks on Ilhan Omar uh, that brought us together. Now, sadly, you know, she continues to get harassed for being as smart and brave and principled as she is, and we continue to stand with her. Yes, and it that was a magnificent day. It was a very hot day, if I, as I recall. You were one of the highlights. One, of, I well, I remember. I mean, certainly, I know of your esteem. I mean, you are a historian, a writer, an activist. Uh, you teach at the University of Illinois at Chicago. You are certainly a world-renowned historian, educator, intellectual. So I certainly knew of you. But when I got the message from you, I was really stunned. And I don't know if you remember when we were face to face and we had a little side moment. I was just really thanking you for inviting me because I said, usually women as for black women, more more to the point, as progressive as I am, are rarely invited to events like like the one that you and other leaders hosted. I was just pleasantly surprised. Well, we were we were we were honored to have you there. Um, I think I first encountered you not in person, but but on television. I was you know had one of the network one of the cable networks in the background, and you were on a news program. And I stopped what I was doing. I was like, wait a minute, who is this sister speaking truth to power? So uh, you know, your voice is one that I had admired from from afar before I knew the person attached to it. Uh, I appreciate your your candor. I, I appreciate the force and independence uh, with which you speak, uh, and and un- unapologetically black and unapologetically progressive. So uh, so that's exactly the kind of person we want to stand in there with us on that day. And sorry it was so hot, but uh, we 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 were we were feeling good about it despite the weather, and and I was feeling very proud that we had such an intergenerational group of folks as well. We really did. And the wet, I mean, not only was it hot, we were hot as mm-hmm. well. So there was yes. an inferno brewing that day. Yes. An inferno of righteousness, righteous indignation. And it was such a beautiful thing to see the Congresswoman's colleagues come out and join yes. in as well. And everyone was so patient and every, it was a joy. I mean, I could see, I could feel joy, even though the moment that brought us together was one that was very serious 
but people took joy in being able to stand with black women in defense of ourselves, as you put it. And you really jumped ahead of where I I was going to go to what you and other black women did in defense of Professor Anita Hill before it was popular to do so. You did not have Twitter. You did not have Instagram to assist you, (laughs) no text messages, just good old fashioned. You all took out a full page ad. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 New York Times. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm really feeling pretty old now. I mean, it's been it's been 29 years and I was just, you know, some issues came up with uh, Joe Biden who presided over those hearings. And I was being reminded uh, that it's been almost 30 years since uh, Anita Hill testified about the sexual harassment that she experienced uh, from uh, now Justice Clarence Thomas. And yeah, we rallied myself, uh, Elsa Barkley Brown, Deborah King, uh, we began to call people old school. You know, we we didn't have uh, Twitter, Instagram, and all these things. Um, and when I tell my students that, they think, "Oh my goodness, how do no I text messages? Yeah. Nothing, nothing." Uh, we had a we had a an eight hundred number, a phone number. You know, where people would call and leave messages as to what you know their name that they wanted to be included in the ad. Basically, we we collected sixteen hundred names. Everyone had to contribute money. We, it was all volunteer. It was not funded. Uh, and people mailed checks. And I still have some of those envelopes and the notes that people sent. You know, envelope with a postage stamp on it, with a check in it to African-American women in defense of ourselves. We had to open a bank account. I mean, you know, so it was labor intensive in, in that sort of old school way. Uh, but it was a labor of love. We, um, you know, we wanted to make our ver- voices heard on our terms and, uh, you know, because people were talking about the issue and they were saying, is this a race issue or is it a gender issue? And of course, it's both. We live both those experiences. Uh, so, yeah. But, you know, the funny thing I will tell you, Senator Turner, I had not met Anita Hill um, when we did that. And it was many, many years. I mean, it's maybe 25 years later that I was giving a talk at Brandeis, where she now teaches. And she's so mild mannered and uh, gracious she came up to me before my talk and she said, excuse me, um, I'm Anita Hill and I just want to say thank you. Like 25 years later, you know, that was how that was how we met and we had a mutual friend. But, um, you know, and I hugged her and it was it was a special moment. But but we didn't know each other. You know, we just we knew we didn't know her. We just knew we had to uh, speak out against the ways in which she was being uh disrespected and dragged through the mud and all kinds of accusations thrown her way because she dared to come forward and she came forward reluctantly. So, yeah, so that was a moment. And many black women face that. I mean, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Women in general face the reality that they come forward, that they are the ones who are going to be on trial, so to speak. Right. You are an African-American woman it's even more so. And so to see with such great force of will that you and other organizers, without her having to ask you, you saw a need. It's the same thing you did with Congresswoman Ilhan Omar with our sisters like Elisa Garza, who I absolutely adore. And to be able to meet one of my sheroes, the one and only Dr. Angela Davis, Mm -hmm. have so many Black women come together and declare what you declared in 1991, African-American women in defense of ourselves, uh, African-American women in defense of Black women of the diaspora, because Mm -hmm. Congresswoman Ilhan Omar is one of those sisters of the diaspora. What, I mean, what was it about, I mean, you you, you all could have just sat back and let the Anita Hill thing just play out and leave her there all alone was there something about that moment was it was it one thing or was it a combination of things that triggered you and other grassroots leader activist type leaders in that moment to say you know what no this is not going to go down like this without us being on record about how we feel about our sister and how she is being treated well, I think, you know, if, if uh, we remember back when I mean, you're younger than I am, so you may, you may not remember it as vividly as I do. But um, but that that 
moment in 1991 uh, when uh, there was such a spectacle on television of Anita Hill being grilled. She looked uncomfortable. She looked, uh, she, she wasn't actually alone, but she looked alone uh, with this, this uh, table full of white male senators glaring down at her, uh, asking all these very personal questions with snide implications. I've got to determine what your motivation might be. Are you a scorned woman? Do you have a militant attitude relative to the area of civil rights? Do you have a martyr complex? The issue of fantasy has arisen. Are you interested in writing a book? It is appropriate to ask Professor Hill anything any member wishes to ask her to plumb the depths of her credibility. It just enraged so many of us. Now, I have to say there were a team of lawyers. Uh, Kimberly Crenshaw was involved. There were a team of Black women lawyers that rallied to her side as well. Uh, Not just Black women, but but, uh, Black men uh, lawyers as well, Black male lawyers as well. So we weren't the only group, but we really also were on the phone to each other. We were really disgusted by the way that the media was invisibilizing her experience and by extension, our experience. So we wanted to make an intervention and it was uh, a very public intervention. And she, you know, of course, later she said she appreciated it uh, when I, when I met her, but we didn't, we didn't rush to her side. I mean, we felt like she did have people around her, people that she knew and so forth. And then the legal team, but we wanted to defend her publicly. We wanted to say, on the pages of the New York Times, and we actually published in other uh, African-American newspapers as well, we wanted to say, here is our statement. Here is how we read what she is doing. Here is how her experience is legible to us. Because people were saying things like, well, we don't know why she didn't come forward sooner. or We don't know. And we knew because we often swallow these things. We often say that we are tough enough to handle it and we don't have to Uh, get any kind of redress. We absorb, we become the shock absorbers for so many insults and so much pain because we have to carry on uh, as black women. And so we understood very well how a survival strategy could have been not to tell anyone, um, could have been not to complain about it, you know, to go on and get to the next phase of her life. So we understood that very well. Uh, And we were very resentful of this way in which Clarence Thomas was being talked about as the legitimate black person or the authentic black person. And she was being talked about as a raceless woman. I mean, she was a black woman and that was very significant. And we wanted to, to make that statement. And so glad you did. One of the prerequisites of being a black woman in America or being a black woman is to absorb Mm -hmm. and to be in fact, super human in ways that other women are not expected or asked to do. Meanwhile, we, our feelings are erased by society. It was Minister Malcolm X who said the most disrespected person in America America is is the black woman. The most unprotected person in America is the black woman. The most neglected person in America is the black woman. You said that in 1962, Dr. Ransby. Is that still true today? I think to a certain extent it is, Um, you know, I think that when we talk about an intersectional analysis, the ways in which different systems of oppression impact our lives, our communities, uh, our bodies, uh, we see with with Black women, it is often class exploitation, it is often uh, gender and sexuality, it is often race, all these things coming together, interacting with each other compounding and reinforcing one another that, you know, impacts our lives essentially. And so, you know, a triple burden, if you will, uh, to quote a, quote an earlier uh, writer, I think we do experience those things. I wouldn't quite say it the way Malcolm would, because, you know, I mean, as much as we admire Malcolm X for so many things, he was not in the forefront uh, of what I would describe as what's needed in terms of, of, of radical black feminism or radical black uh, thought around gender. So, um, you know, he talked about sort of protecting black women. And, and, and today we really talk about protecting ourselves and having our own defense of ourselves be supported. Uh, so, so that's kind of how I, I see it, maybe a little bit different, dare I, 
<laughs> disagree with with Malcolm X, but uh, but seeing it a little bit different than than the way Malcolm X uh, framed it all those years ago. But definitely, black women uh, experiencing sexual harassment, sexual violence in larger numbers, often not being believed, not not having a sympathetic ear, not having the resources to escape. Uh, that kind of treatment, whether it's from the state or an intimate partner. So, so yeah, I mean, um, you know, black women are still uh, catching hell, if you will. Yeah, it's very vulnerable in all of those areas, still disproportionate to our numbers in the population. And certainly Minister Michael Max was a product of his time. Yeah. For someone of that era to even say what he said was revolutionary in and of itself to acknowledge that about American society, that the the hurdles and the bur- burdens really that black women face. Mm-hmm. And so, Doc, it leads me to you, how you are a, you're an author and you teach. And so we want to have some, le- a little lecture from the professor. One <laughs> of the books, Ella Baker and the Black Freedom Movement, a radical democratic vision. One of the things about the question of racism that, or at least in talking to people, the question that frequently has come up recently with me is, well, we are not guilty, personally, of course you're not. I don't know that there's anybody in this room has carried on a campaign of racism per se, but I doubt that there's anybody in this room who has not at some point been guilty of supporting a racist culture. And we must search ourselves to find out how we have been guilty. Not for the sake of just wallowing in our guilt, but for the sake of facing the fact that the future of our culture, of our country, depends not so much on what black people do as it does depend on what white people do. It's very fitting for the moment that we're in right now. If you, and people always ask historians to, if this person was alive, what do you think that they (laughs) would do? So I'm gonna follow what folks usually do in this case, seeing that uh, Ella Baker was such a force for civil rights and and justice and was a leader in her own right. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. So nobody's resting right now because we got to fight on our hands. What do you think, are there any comparisons to what Ella Baker was pushing for and that whole notion of a radical democratic vision? Do you see any of that playing out right now before our eyes? I do. I really do. Um, And it's heartening to me because in some ways, uh, Ella Baker, like a lot of uh, women organizers like her, uh, did not really get her due during her lifetime. I mean, she was kind of a legend within the movement, but not very well known outside of it. Uh, And, you know, we we saw the, the sort of deification of Dr. King and others. But, you know, Ella Baker had a much longer political career than King. She she fought in the trenches uh, sadly, you know, his life was taken away fairly young, but she fought in the trenches uh, for racial uh, justice for many, many decades. And I think there are particular lessons that I take away from my research on Ella Baker, a uh, particular inspiration that I take away from Ella Baker's example. And, I, you know, it just it just warms my heart that I see her teachings manifest in some of the movements today. So one thing is around leadership. Uh, she really emphasized grassroots leadership. She emphasized decentralized leadership. She said, nobody, you know, there are no saviors for us politically. We have to save ourselves. And, um, you know, she had this famous quote, a strong people don't need a strong leader, you know, meaning that we are, uh, as Patrice Kahn Cullors said, you know, one of the founders of the uh, hashtag Black Lives Matter. Patrice said once, uh, you know, we are a leader full movement, not a leader. What we've movement. seen is uh thousands of black people showing up for our lives with very little infrastructure and very little support. Um, I think our work as movement leaders isn't just about our own visibility, um, but rather how do we make uh, the whole visible? Um, How do we not just fight for our individual selves, but fight for everybody? Um, And 
I also think、um, leadership looks like everybody in this audience、um, showing up for Black Lives.、Um, it's not just about coming and watching people on a stage, right? It's about how do you become that leader, whether it's in your workplace,、uh, whether it's in your home,、um, and believe that the movement for Black Lives isn't just for us, but it's for everybody. And I think that would have very much resonated、uh, with with Ella Baker. She also、uh, invested a lot of time in the leadership of young people. And I often say she did not fetishize youth. She did not say just because you are young, you are right.、Uh, but when young people were on the right side of history,、uh, she was right there with them and standing behind them and supporting them, and also learning from them. And so I do think we see young people in the forefront of this fight right now.、Um, Demanding police out of the schools, demanding、uh, accountability from politicians, demanding attention to climate,、uh, etc. So I think that would warm Ella Baker's heart as well.、Uh, and the final thing I'll say is,、um, you know, she said, "Let's look at the most marginal people in our communities." You know, she was around a lot of people who had academic degrees, uh, uh, clerical credentials, ministers, and the like. And she said, "All that is fine, but it's the people who are doing the lowest-paid jobs, the least respected jobs. It's the people who might not conform to middle-class standards of respectability. Those are the people we have to be worried about. That's the real measure of whether we have radical democracy. Not if the the the, the sort of most." Heralded and accomplished and celebrated individuals get their rights, but if everybody gets their rights, and so I really appreciate the way in which this movement has、uh, focused on、uh, our incarcerated brothers and sisters, formerly incarcerated folks, and people have also in the campaign around police violence refused to fall into the trap of defining some victims as sympathetic and others as not sympathetic. So even going back to Mike Brown. There was an attempt to、uh, to really discredit him as a victim, you know, by saying he had done this and he had done that, and he wasn't really a good、different、guy. Different people are seeing different things tonight in this newly released video from this Ferguson convenience store. Keep your eye on the box of cigarellos. That's Michael Brown Jr. the night before he was killed in 2014 by a city police officer. A filmmaker and Brown's family says what he's doing here is trading the carton of smokes for marijuana. And they believe that he leaves the carton in the store, hoping to come get it later. That's not stealing the store. That interpretation matters because of this video that authorities released days after the shooting. The next morning, Brown is back at the store, and what police have always described as a strong-arm robbery: his one hand grabbing the cigars, his other on the storekeeper's neck. Tonight, the store is adamant they don't do layaway, and they've released the full video that they say shows. There was no exchange for drugs. He's going to start arguing with the the clerk.、Uh, similarly, the clerk that you know、no. that that occurred、I'm、with with others、way. as well.、Uh, Eric Garner was selling loose cigarettes. What kind of crime is that?、Uh, but but ways to make people feel that these are not people that deserve your empathy or your sympathy. That maybe they got what you know what was coming to them because they were doing something wrong. And this movement has so flatly. And eloquently rejected that. I am so proud of them,、um, and that was very much the spirit of Ella Baker's、uh, organizing. She was like, "I don't, you know, I don't want to meet the person with the fancy title. I want to meet the person that's picking cotton. I want to meet, you know." She would even describe this person as a town drunk, which meant, you know, the the person that might get thrown in jail for drinking too much on a Friday night.、Uh, on. That person deserves rights too. You know, that person is not to be thrown under the bus. So that was that was how she organized, and I think she would be proud of a lot of the young organizers today who are carrying on in that in that same spirit. I'd like to hear you describe her work and what informed her work. It makes me think about what we call essential workers、mm-hmm. today. Those、Absolutely. are she would be standing side by side with and speaking up. For and then the notion of who is worthy of justice is something that has plagued this nation for a very long time. And yes, most of the high-profile cases they dig into the backgrounds of the victims and try to、uh, to to make it seem as though those people who were in fact victims 
didn't deserve or or conversely deserved what happened to them. They tried right. to do George Floyd as well, but what happened to him was just so this it was just so viscerally upsetting that mm-hmm. they could not get that off in the way that they usually do and just the arrogance of that police officer to uh, keep his entire body on his neck for eight minutes, 46 seconds with his hands in his pocket. It was just so clear. I mean, it just reminded me of what uh, freedom fighters had to go through in the sixties as, you know, dogs were, were sicked on them, water Mm -hmm. hoses, you know, all of the visual, just looking at him just reminded me of the visual impressions that it leaves on your mind about the brutality, uh, not just of some police in America, but America's brutality towards African-American people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and, and people have asked me in different interviews and conversations, you know, why, why this case, why this moment, you know, because really it is an unprecedented moment of protest. Uh, I don't think we've seen in our lifetime this many, particularly white people, you know, hitting the streets militantly in a pandemic, facing tear gas to say no to racism. I mean, that is almost downright un-American, I mean, in a sense, in, in, yeah. in terms of the, the history, the long history of this country, yeah. uh, where racism has been ignored, minimized, swept under the rug uh, by the majority population. So to see that happening in this moment, we should ask why. And I think you know, there are h- historical moments where the contradictions, the outrage become, become so clear that decent people can't look the other way. You know, I remember some of the research I did on the civil rights movement, and it was particularly some scenes in Little Rock in 1957, where these mobs came out to throw rocks and spit at uh, the, the Little Rock Nine, the young people who were, who were there to desegregate Little Rock Central High School. Yeah. Uh, organized by Daisy Bates and other local leaders. And the uh, news media interviewed these two young white women, girls, uh, who went to the school. And they were they, there was a shock on their faces. And they said, do you support, you know, the at that time called Negro students? Do you support the Negro students or you just, do you support, you know, the, the white people who are out there? And they looked at the, the mob and they looked at the students and they said, well, we haven't learned a lot about this issue, but we know that we're not with them, meaning the white mob. So, I mean, I think there's that moment in which you look at a Derek uh, uh, Chauvin and you si- and, and people had to say, yeah. are you the kind of person that will accept this on your watch? Will you, are you going to be associated with this level of, of lynching, of, of vicious execution in broad daylight? And who are you, if you will? And so, you know, of course, there have been other examples where you wish people would have stepped up, but it was so undeniably vicious, indefensible, heinous, and all of that, and, and circulated, you know, that I think it, it, it was the last straw for a lot of people. Now, I'll, what I also want to say when I say that is, as we know, um, these things, you know, consciousness doesn't just evolve uh without impetus. It does not evolve without a push. So the fact that there have been people organizing from 2014 to now, and even before that, you know, from the early uh, 2000s around police violence, really going back to the 60s, but if we want to keep it immediate, yes, people have been holding forums and town halls and debates and in classrooms, educating people about these issues, confronting people about their uh, lack of attention to these issues. And so we have to believe that at some point something sinks in and everybody doesn't get it, but enough people get it to make a difference. Absolutely. And we are seeing that, feeling that right now, even in the midst of COVID, as you reminded us, that people really are coming out and and making it known that they do not, do not support what is happening in this country and we know that we need as many voices united to bump up, bump back against injustice. And that is what is happening. Good doctor. Talk, speaking of the Little Rock Nine in high school, you know, why is it, you know, and I felt this way as a college student too, that mm-hmm. 
I hear so many people talk about the fact that they don't really learn the true history of this country, the good, the bad, and the ugly in high school or in junior high. It is not until they go to college that their eyes are open, their consciousness is pricked, and you find yourself in the classroom, I was one of those, asking yourself or saying to yourself, why didn't I know this sooner? What is it? So you you you're in the academy and you teach students once they get to the college level. What is it though about the teaching of American history that or lack thereof that prevents us as a society to come to grips with the good, the bad, and the ugly and to teach it all in 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 its context, to frame it all so that we produce more informed citizens. Not everybody will go to college, but most of our folks, I mean, it's law that children of a certain age, they have to go to school. So why wouldn't we teach the type of robust history that many of us were fortunate enough to get? And uh, to get, why don't we teach that way in K through 12? And what can we do to change this so that less people are in college saying, I wish I had learned this in high, in high school? Mm-hmm. Well, I think there are um, pockets of educators. There's a group called Teachers for Social Justice, um, uh, our own union here in Chicago, Chicago Teachers Union, which uh, have, have done a lot of innovative things around uh, curriculum. And then I think there are different projects like the, the, Zen, the Howard Zinn uh, Education Project that does curriculum for teachers. So I think there are those kinds of um, efforts to offer alternatives to public school teachers who are trying to have some autonomy in their classrooms. I've, you know, we, of course, have seen a pushback from conservative groups who want to control the textbooks that are uh, in use in classrooms. We saw in uh, out West a pushback against ethnic studies in high schools. So it's always been a struggle. How this country tells the story of its past is a huge battlefield. It's a huge area of struggle. I mean, we see now in the midst of the uh, anti-police violence uh, uprising, uh, people taking down statues of Confederate soldiers and Confederate heroes, really contesting how public space is used to educate people, too. And I think it's, um, you know, basically, you know, the country has had an ascendant narrative that is a, a triumphant narrative. You know, we started off making mistakes and We've gotten better and better, and 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 look at us now. You know, I think Mitch McConnell said. You know, I, I don't think reparations for something that happened 150 years ago, for whom none of us currently living are responsible, is a good idea. Uh, we've, you know, tried to deal with our original sin of slavery by fighting a civil war, by passing uh, landmark civil rights legislation. Uh, we've elected an African American well, president. How can somebody say that there's still res- racism? We had a black president, uh, so I think it's that desire for a celebratory, a self-congratulating, an ascendant, progressive narrative of this country's history that 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 leads us to continue to tell lies about the past and the present. Um, and of course, the the past, if we go back to uh, the beginning, if you will, uh, the theft of of indigenous land and black labor were the the dual pillars of the founding of the uh, the North American colonies, which became the United States. So so that was a pretty um, bloody beginning, and uh, you know generations of injustice have defined a society now that is vastly unequal, where there's the greatest wealth disparity uh, that that we've ever seen. Uh, it's it's pretty obscene. And we still haven't come to terms with it. I was very, I don't know if you saw um, the uh, New York Times Magazine piece by uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones, which, um, you know, outlined, it, the title of it was What is Owed? And it made the case for reparations. It made the case for confronting the past as a way to find justice in the present. And that the only way to do that is some sort of reckoning. And it's not just saying, we're sorry. That's right. Something has to go along with that. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Something measurable. Right. You know, I think it was the the great James Baldwin who once said, "Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed." 
until it is faced. That's and true. That, that is what you are talking about, Professor. That yeah. it's amazing to me how the losing side got the opportunity to write history. I mean, you think about that. Those who defend the placement of those statues. I mean, certainly as a historian myself, they're, they're, they should be in museums. We should tell the whole story, tell mm-hmm. it all. But we do not have to build edifices to these folks throughout the country and force people to have to come face to face with those on a regular basis. And certainly in spaces that are paid for with taxpayers' dollars. I mean, it's glorification and it really goes back to the whole the lost cause doc and and the you know how the what was that the the the, the women of that the, the the united daughters of the confederacy mm-hmm. really pushed and worked really hard to make sure that they paid homage so to speak to those confederate soldiers so much so they had influence in not only helping to make sure that those statues were placed but also in the education that many Southern students received, thereby that kept perpetuating itself generation after generation after generation. And so we have Americans, both white, black, and other, who start to believe this hype about the quote unquote lost cause, you know, that the Confederate fight was heroic and enslaved people were happy and slavery was not the root cause. I mean, they totally rewrote history, Dr. Ransby. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and rewrote it over and over again. I mean, bef- before I decided to focus on um, the 20th century as a period of you know, studying African American history, I was very interested. Uh, in the period of slavery and reconstruction and, uh, you know, how that period defined the, you know, contemporary realities that we face. And there has been a succession of historians. So when we look at the the historiography, the history of the history, uh, there have been generations of historians who have told distorted stories about uh, the institution of slavery, the legacy of slavery and so forth. It was, it was first, as you describe it, you know, group of historians that talked about it as the benevolent institution, uh, that, that, that the slaves were happy, that enslaved people were happy, and uh, the, 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 their owners were like father figures. You know, there was that first lie. And then there were other uh, uh, historians who countered that, but in a way that still had racism embedded in it, basically saying, no, slavery was this heinous institution. It actually destroyed Black people psychologically. Now, that's not true either. That does not appreciate the resilience, the strength, the determination to survive and preserve culture that existed even under um, the the dark and dangerous conditions of slavery. Today, we have even another uh, group of historians who are really uh, writing some pretty powerful books that indict economic exploitation as being at the very heart of the slave system along with white supremacy. And I think that's so important because a lot of times also the other distortion was, you know, it was a peculiar Southern institution and the North then thought, well, they were more advanced, more modern, more civilized. Uh, It was the backward Southerners, but white Northerners benefited from Southern slavery, even after slavery had been abolished in the North. You know, banks uh, accepted uh, enslaved humans as collateral on loans uh, and, and all of that. So, um, you know, so it's a story that the entire nation is implicated in, uh, in terms of, of, of crimes against humanity, crimes against black people. And really, you know, back to the reparations demand and back to the how we tell the history uh, question, um, it is all very, very immediate, very urgent, very relevant to this moment. And let's tell those stories so that we can grow, so that we can change. I know for some people, they will have to go through the stages of grief once they fully understand the depth, the breadth, the impact of what anti-Blackness and racism has done to not only destroy the fabric. I mean, it's in all of those things, racism, anti-Blackness, what happened to our indigenous sisters and brothers very much in the fabric of this country. So when people say, this is not who we are. Oh no, baby, this is who we are. Uh-huh. I mean, Dr. Rich, that drives me crazy as a historian because we do want to believe I mean, even I, you know, naively, I want to believe in the great words that were written by the framers, beautiful words, 
we need to live those words and they need to be lived and appreciated and accessible to all people, even though at the time they wrote those words, they didn't mean us. They didn't mean <laughs> white women. They didn't mean indigenous people. Hell, even at the beginning, they weren't even talking about poor white men. Hello, somebody. I mean, let's mm-hmm. just go to tell this, this truth. But the whole notion of white skin privilege took over. And then it was a pretty much a divide and conquer. And we've been living that out every single day in this country in one form or another. It we we are we are continuously reminded that we have not done the hard and necessary work to turn this around, including what you just said, which is a debt is definitely owed to African Americans in the United States of America. And so we need to get to understanding that pain what brought us to this place and how we fix it other than saying sorry is a start, but you got to put some, something down on that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And look into the future. I mean, I really, I I do believe we have to rethink uh, this society in a fundamental way. You know, uh, people talk a lot about Dr. King, at least once a year, people do remember him. Um, and he was someone who evolved uh, over time. And, and by the end of his life, he was focusing on racial justice, of course, but he was also focusing on war and militarism. And most, most urgent, urgently, he was focusing on poverty and economic injustice and the way in which Black people had been robbed and exploited uh, inexcusably. Uh, others as well, not just Black people, but Black people disproportionately, starting with Uh, slavery. So um, that is part of the unfinished agenda of the Black Freedom Movement. And I don't think within the confines of how this system works, we can really settle the score, if you will. I think we have to reimagine how the economy works. And, and, uh, you know, one of the things that I appreciated about the, uh, the discourse as it evolved in the presidential election is to really indict uh, what I would describe as racial capitalism, you know, to indict uh, a system that that allows for excessive accumulation of wealth at one end of the spectrum and dire poverty, you know, a few blocks away from, um, you know, a billion dollar homes. I mean, that that is just untenable in the future. It is untenable to calculate justice in the context of a society that allows that to exist. So I think we have to rethink some things very, very fundamental in order to do right by black people uh, and certainly to uh, to recast and remake a different kind of society. Amen to that. And even in the midst of this pandemic, Doc, where so many people are suffering, so many people are losing their jobs, the wealthiest, the ultra wealthy. And I try to be careful when I say wealth, because to me, wealth is a beautiful thing that has many facets to it. Your health is your wealth. Love is your wealth. Being of good mind. You know, my grandmother used to always say, I thank the Lord I'm clothed in my right mind. I didn't understand that, Doc, growing up. <laughs> by and by, I understand just what grand, grandma meant. Clothed mm-hmm. in my right mind. That is wealth. You know, having a heart is wealth. I mean, though, so we put all of that, but what the what you are describing is not, is not wealth. It is greed. It is unfettered greed. It is making money in a way that not only disadvantages another, but actually starves the majority from being able to have access to their measure of the American dream, from being able to live a good life, not even really looking back and caring about who you are impacting as long as you make money, 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 money even in the midst of a pandemic, the ultra wealthy, they're not suffering. Matter of fact, they're making more money Uh during this Uh crisis while people Uh are losing their jobs and losing their health insurance. So I do agree with you, Doug. I don't know how we can rebuild on a faulty foundation. I don't know. Yeah, no, that's a good, that's a good point. I mean, Uh and I think, you know, to to bring us back to the pandemic uh, uh, with, with your words, I mean, the pandemic has revealed the contradictions, the injustices, the inequalities, 
the economic violence that predates it, right? So when the pandemic hits, you know, you talked about essential workers, those people who are at the very bottom of the economic hierarchy, the most, most vulnerable, those people are, they're hungry. They are hungry and, and the, the moratorium on evictions is about to expire. People are not going to have money for rent. We are going to see uh, at least an attempt at large scale eviction. So we're going to look, be looking at a, a growing homeless population and even just how people are treated uh, in the healthcare system, the inequalities of the healthcare system. You have rich hospitals that actually never missed a beat. Let me just tell you. Uh, here in Chicago, there are wealthy hospitals that did not miss a beat. They had the PPE that they needed. They had the ventilators that they needed. They had the staff that they needed. It is more vulnerable institutions and the vulnerable people that they serve that were in the greatest jeopardy and the greatest harm. You had states and hospitals competing on the open market to see how much they could pay to get life-saving ventilators. Now, that doesn't show you the corruption and backwardness of our economy, I don't know what does. That 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 should not even be legal. You know, uh, I remember when Cuomo was doing his his daily coronavirus briefings from New York City. He was like, we we, we could get a, a a ventilator six months ago for this amount of money. Now it's five times that. So that kind of price gouging with people's lives at stake is is just another aspect of the. Uh, immoral foundations of the economy uh, and the untenable nature of it going forward. That's it, Doc. That word immoral came front of mind when you said it, because at some point we, we got to talk about morality here. What Where is the integrity to decide as a nation that the course that we're on with this type of capitalism cannot sustain itself. It is not sustainable and it is not right. And since government creates the rules, I mean, government is supposed to be the referee. Right. And so far, the ultra, ultra wealthy are winning. They win in the game and they're winning it in a way that is causing harm, life and death harm to the vast majority of people in this country. I mean, I saw some stats that showed that the, the billionaire class, I think it's 643 of them have seen their wealth go up by $584 billion while millions upon millions of people are losing their jobs, while poorer households have seen their their wealth go down by $6.5 trillion. Yeah, that's, that's, it's inexcusable. It's inexcusable. And it's so interesting, you know, how we get socialized to accept certain kinds of things as normal. And that's something that interests me as a historian, you know, we can look back and most people, maybe not all, but most people would say slavery was an immoral institution. Uh, people would say Jim Crow was an unfair uh, institution. People would, you know, people say, you know, fascism was uh, uh, immoral, outrageous, indefensible. Um, but then we have all of these gross examples that are, in some ways, easily correctable, and 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 we walk right past and we become desensitized. Uh, to those things. I think that's that's part of the glue that holds an unfair system together too, is that it seduces us into accepting as normal uh, all of these fundamentally immoral realities. Doc, that's the word. Let's not be seduced. Mm-hmm. How about that? Let's, let's run from, from seduction, especially immoral seduction. But you're, you're absolutely right. We, we are brainwashed in many ways we have come to we, we're socialized and so unless you deconstruct your construction I used to say to my students all the time that <laughs> one of my professors reminded us in class that that is what we must do uh, as a songwriter said free your mind we, we have right. to free our minds so that we can be open to the possibilities of seeing things and doing things in a different way so that we can make this society work for all. These things that we have discussed today, Doc, were done on purpose, and I firmly believe that they can be undone on purpose, and it will be because of the grassroots bubbling up all across this country, forming coalition with one another, that we will get to the change we need to, we need to have. 
Doc, any any recommendations? You know, a lot of people always want to know what 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 should I read? You know, I'm one of those too. What what you what? So what should we who want to understand this moment that we're in from a historic perspective? What should we read? Oh wow, uh, I, so many things. You don't want to start me. We'll be here all night. Um, there's so many brilliant people writing. Uh, I would say, you know, of course, Angela Davis's um, Our Prisons Obsolete uh, is a very, a very important um, text in terms of thinking about abolition. Uh, a, a historian called Dan Berger wrote a book called Captive Nation, also about this question of prison uh, and, and so forth. I actually um, have been rereading Blood in the Water, which is uh, by Heather Ann Thompson, and it was a um, it, it won the it won the Pulitzer, and it talks about the Attica uprising uh, that happened in the early uh, 1970s. I think all of those are important places to start. Uh, there's also a book called Black Against Empire. It's about uh, the Black Panther Party. We don't talk about the Black Panther Party as much as we uh, could or should, and and there's all sorts of stereotypes about who the Panthers were, but. Um, they really had this note. They had a critique of, of police brutality and violence, but they also had an economic analysis. They were critics of capitalism and war and empire, and they had an ethic of service. Uh, I remember when I first encountered them in Detroit as a young child, they were doing free breakfast programs uh, in, in the school where I was a student. And um, it was the first time I saw men wearing aprons. So, you know, so to really expand our notion of the black freedom movement, to uh, deepen our understanding of how uh, the the sort of carceral state works, if you will, how the different controls uh, within society help to hold things in place. I would also say um, there's a young political scientist named Adam Getachew, um, Ethiopian American, and she has a a book called World Making After Empire. And it talks about that moment in world history after, you know, during decolonization when African nations were emerging and some of the independent nations of Asia, and they were looking to make a new world. Now, in some ways, they succeeded in getting rid of colonialism as we knew it, but in other ways, they failed. But she talks about that period of hope and experimentation and solidarity, uh, and it's a very beautiful book. So anyway, those those are just some things that are on my, on my uh, desk right now. There it is. We have heard from the good doctor some of the books that you can begin to read to free your mind. And I am going to recommend Ella Baker and the (laughs) Black Freedom Movement, a radical democratic vision written by the wonderful, the magnificent, and the ever enlightening Dr. Barbara (laughs) Rand. Thank you. That's very nice of you. Thank you. I appreciated this conversation. It's good to hear your voice. You too, Doc. I appreciate you as well and all of your work. And it was such a pleasure just to get to know you uh, better. And yeah, we're going we're gonna to keep this going. We're going to stay in touch and keep doing the good work. Hello Somebody is a production of Large Media Network. Our logo and web design was created by Grace & Co. Special thanks to other members of the Hello Somebody team. Tiffany Hale, Pepper Chambers, the hot one, Julia Griffin, Angelo Greco, and Anna Mesa. Now, if you would like to support our production, please become a member on patreon.com forward slash hello somebody. And finally, come join us for more conversation on my social media channels at Nina Turner.